Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meanahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Today we're going to take a look at Mythotopia from Martin Wallace and his company Tree Frog Games. Now, I had only ever played one Martin Wallace game before I played Mythotopia and another new game from Martin Wallace called Onward to Venus that I'm reviewing concurrently with this. Um, and if you want to know all of my thoughts on Studying Emeralds, you can go back and watch my review and my one year later look back at that. And the bottom line of it was just that I think it's a great game that has a lot of weird, clunky stuff to it, a lot of excess to it, and I'm still not entirely sure how to feel about it to this day after multiple plays of it. Mythotopia, I really didn't know what to expect from it. I certainly didn't think it had any kind of connection to A Study in Emerald. It's just, it looked like a generic fantasy area control game to me. Then I found out it had a little bit of deck building, and I'm like, huh, okay, I'm intrigued. Then I actually played the game, and I realized, okay, this has a lot to do with Study in Emerald. Mechanically speaking, I mean, there's no Cthulhu, there's no Sherlock Holmes, there's no, uh, you know, game it involved in any way, shape, or form, as far as I can tell. This is, like I said, generic fantasy world where you're trying to vie for control of all these different territories on the map in this only vaguely fantasy world, actually. There's rumors of dragons, and I guess there's tokens that represent dragons, and that's kind of about it. Uh, and there is deck building as a main mechanism, but why don't we just get right to it. We'll do a brief overview of how the game is played, then we're going to come back, and I'll let you know what I think. All right, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of Mythotopia. This is a competitive game for two to five players. The goal is to take territory in this game called provinces. Every province that you have control of is going to give you three points. You have a score track around the edges of the board. You're also going to be able to get points for uh, a multitude of different, uh, let's call them sort of achievement victory cards that you're trying to meet the conditions of and take the point tokens for. You'll score the points for those as well. And then this game has a weird mechanic, which I'll get back to in a little, uh, a little bit, where when you think you have enough points to win the game and a couple of other different conditions are met, then you can declare at the start of your turn the game is over, and you can only do that if you're winning, and therefore, you are the winner. We'll explain all that in a second, but first, a little bit of setup. So you have the board here with all of the different provinces, and we'll go ahead and just take a look at that. Each of these provinces at the start of the game has neutral forces in them. That's what those numbers represent on the board. The symbols on there, like shields and grain, those represent the different uh, symbols that could be on the province card corresponding to that particular area. And those are resources you're gonna use with the deck building portion of the game in order to take certain actions. Now you also see that there are hills, which are gonna be uh, harder to traverse, and seas, which only ships can traverse. There are mountains, which are intraversible. You'll have to go around those. And then these purple tokens out here have to do with specific victory achievements. So we're gonna get back to those in a minute. But you'll have the board laid out here and then you're gonna have uh, your tokens. This is a setup for a two player game based on uh, the number of provinces that you have control of. So at the beginning of the game, each player is going to get 11 province cards. Each province card is going to key into one of the provinces on the board. And I'll show you right there the name and the typical the resource associated with it. And each player also gets a hand of four cards. It says five in the instruction booklet, but that's a misprint. So the four cards that you have, you have build, which uh, makes sense. You're gonna, it's gonna let you build stuff. Uh, in this case, it's gonna let you build uh, cities and territory you control, or roads, or castles, potentially. These are the amount of stone symbols you need on the cards. And then it says that it requires an action, one of your actions on your turn. Uh, and each turn you should get two actions. Now the thing is, every card can only be used for one of two things. So you can actually use the build card as a stone symbol for another action you're taking, but then you won't be able to use this card to build. It's one or the other. You also have a ship, same thing here. You can use this card as a ship or as grain, or you can use it to actually invade across a sea area, which lets you put one of your ship tokens, uh, well, actually, that's the other thing is that you can choose to uh, put one of your ship tokens down on the board, or you can take an existing army and let it invade across one of the seas. Next, you have the market card, uh, who doesn't have any kind of special ability, but the main benefit is that you have 
all uh, three of the different types of symbols. You have stone, you have gold, and you have grain. And then finally you have the army car, which has two shield symbols and a gold. Now over here to the side, you have all the different improvement cards. Improvement cards, you're gonna start the game with 16 of them, and you're gonna be able to purchase them uh, as one of your actions by spending uh, one of the gold that you can produce from one of your cards and taking it and putting it into your deck because this is the deck building game. In a deck building game, you have a hand of starting cards, which in this case is the uh, colored cards keyed into the different player that I just showed you, those four cards, plus the province cards that you start off with. In a two-player game, it's 11 cards. And then you may potentially be able to buy these improvement cards and you'll eventually shuffle them up, use them, then deal, uh, draw five at the start of your turn, and so on, if you're familiar with uh, deck building mechanics. But just to take a look, at some of these you have ones like gold mine which affects your reserve once per turn uh, you can play any one card and have it count as one gold you have another version of the army card which is just the same as the one that you have but uh, it's just another version for that that you have in your deck because it'd be very powerful if you're attempting to go for uh, military more than anything else the portal card is going to let you use it as a grain but you can also uh, substitute for a province card when invading and you may invade any province on the board. And then the last little bit of setup stuff I'll explain are the victory point cards. Now there are victory point cards that are always in play, the roads, the castle, and the city, but then there are other ones, these four that are randomized, the four purple ones. So the ones that are uh, always in play, the roads, castles, and cities, anytime that you build a road you're able to take one of the tokens off of this card, so that's going to give you two victory points. Same thing with the castle. If you build a castle, you'll be able to take one of those. And when you build a city, which requires that you've already got a town uh, in or a village in one of those uh, regions, then you can build the city and take one of those. Remember, you need to build cart and the necessary resources in order to do that. Then you have these randomized ones, so we'll just go over these. Here be dragons. Now, out on the board, you have these different tokens with the dragon symbol on it. And whenever you invade one of these territories, which is very difficult to do with the dragon in it, when you are successfully able to do that and take control of the territory, you'll remove the dragon marker and then you get to take one of those dragon victory point tokens. It's the same thing with the rune stones, although those are much easier to take. Uh, it's basically just looking at whatever the neutral number there is and taking control of that. Then you have a couple other ones out here. You have Defender of the Realm. You can take one whenever you successfully defend one of your provinces from an enemy attack. And Roadside Inn. Whenever you build one of the roads, you can also spend a coin and take a victory coin, uh, victory point from here. And there are other cards uh, that are in the game that can give you uh, victory point cards that may potentially be in the game that will have different altering effects. While we're over here pointed in this direction, this is the red player's component. This is the reserve card. Now the reserve card is going to start off with that two uncovered. Uh, there's actually an alternate side for a different variant in the game, but we're not going to cover that. Uh, this is uh, has city tokens on four of the five spots. This means that at this point your reserve is two, but as you build cities out on the board, your reserve is going to grow all the way up to five potentially. On your turn, one of the actions you can take is to stow any cards that you want from your hands uh, up to the limit of the number that's on the card currently. Uh, into your reserve. This means on future turns they're not in your hand, they're not clogging up your deck, but you can use them at any time so long as they're there during your turn. Here are the stacks of the different tokens that the players have access to. So I think at this point the best thing to do is just to go through the turn order and describe the different things that you can do. Remember that this is a deck building game so those rules still apply. You'll have your deck of cards, you'll draw five. If you ever have to draw more, you'll reshuffle your deck, your deck and then at the end of your turn you'll draw five more. So the different actions you can do, one of them is to invade a province. In order to invade a province, first off you need to have the province card that is keyed into the area that you are trying to invade from. As you can tell, there's no armies actually out on the board. It's just assumed that your troops are constantly on the move trying to take control of this generic fantasy world. So you'll have to have the province card that you want to use to invade from. So let's say that I'm trying to invade from margins, which is all the way down here in the corner. Uh, this is one of the territories that I have control of. And then I'm going to uh, have to use at least a couple, well, first off I'll choose the territory that I'm invading into, then play as many cards as I like with these army symbols on them in order to put down the uh, army tokens into the area that I'm invading from. So if I'm invading from margin, I can't go over the mountains, but I can go, let's just go ahead and zoom in on that 
I can decide to go over there to Stom Scombroid. I love these names. And let's say that I only spend my army card in order to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and put two of my army tokens down there. But I also have to spend a card that has a food on it because my troops are on the march into enemy territory. So there are at least three cards that you need to play because each card can only be used for one thing. And if I was trying to go over the hills, which are not in this area, but I, which I uh, might traverse in other areas, I have to spend an extra food. Uh, now, one of the other actions you can do, however, is just to add more troops to a territory that you already control. Uh, but I don't technically control this area yet because I haven't actually declared victory there. So once I have a number of tokens here, if I ever beat the neutral force number that is here, then I'm able to claim victory. So at this point, I still haven't yet because it's two, but let's say on a future turn, I'm able to put more tokens down there. At the start of my turn, as the very first thing that I do, I can declare victory in that area, in which case I take back my army tokens, I put out one of my village tokens, and now that area belongs to me. I can even upgrade that to a city with my second action if I could. Now, if it was an enemy, an opponent's uh, card, or an opponent's region, it would be the same process, except that they, the, your opponent would have a chance to respond by putting down armies of their own. And every time that you gain control of a region, you uh, successfully and declare victory there, not only do you gain three points for having control of that region, and if you swipe it away from an opponent, they lose three points, but you're also immediately going to take the province card associated with that region and put it into your deck. Even if it's in the other player's deck, they have to give it to you. Also, if you want to invade across the sea, you have to actually use a uh, ship card that lets you invade across the sea, assuming that you have ships there. All right, so I mentioned you could place and you can remove armies. Uh, that's one of the things that you can do on your turn with your one of your two actions as well. You can choose to end the war, uh, which I already mentioned. You can buy armies and ships. So eventually the tokens that you have are going to run out and not be enough potentially for your armies and ships, depending on how warlike you are. So you may want to use coins uh, on the cards that you have in order to actually buy more ships and more soldiers from your general stock that you don't have access to and add them to your available stock. Then you can choose to draft an improvement card. Like I mentioned before, you can spend a coin and take one of those cards from the lineup and put it into your deck, but those are all the cards that you have available for the entire game. You can choose to place cards into your reserve, which I already mentioned as well, putting stowing cards onto that card that has the city tokens on it. You can also choose to purposefully discard cards. Now, you have a hand limit of five, and unlike in some other deck building games, if you don't use every card that's in your hand, that you don't just get to dump them, uh, they, they'll stick around from round to round, but you may want to dump them because you have used up all your actions for the turn. You don't like the cards that you have. You want to have. You want to start fresh next. So maybe for your second action, you've, you've used your first action. Maybe for your second action, you choose to discard your hand and therefore draw back up fresh up to five. Alternatively, you could permanently remove one or two cards from uh, from your deck. So let's say that you just really don't have a use for this uh, margin territory anymore. Either you're not trying to do anything in that area or you just don't want or need it and you don't need the symbol up on the top of the card and it's just clogging up your deck. You can choose to remove one or two of those types of cards permanently and they go into the lineup and you can potentially buy them again later just like drafting the improvement cards. You can perform the actions on cards or very simply you can just pass. That's just something you can do if you have nothing else better, better that you can do on your turn. And that's really it. I know that's a very quick run through of Mythotopia, but you're essentially playing the cards from your deck building, trying to, uh, using deck building mechanics, trying to take over regions of territory, either from the neutral territory or from uh, your opponent, putting out your villages, getting points that way. You're trying to meet the conditions on the uh, randomized victory point cards in the standard ones, and also possibly drafting improvement cards to help you along during the entire process. There's a few small things I miss, like, oh, actually, I didn't explain building roads. Roads can go between different territories, and castles will actually improve the defense of the areas that you're in when you build them, and so on. But those are minor things. You get the gist of Mythotopia. Let's go to my final thoughts. Okay, the theme and components of Mythotopia are what I'm going to be most critical of, so why don't we just go ahead and rip that Band-Aid off right now. Thematically, I don't understand what this is supposed to be. It's a fantasy world. It doesn't seem to be linked to any kind of 
fiction before this, like A Study in Emerald was, or like Onward to Venus, uh, the other game that's new from him, is linked to. There's nothing there. I don't see any kind of backstory. It's just, just really, really generic. It's almost like... If I mean, it looks good. I mean, we'll just talk about component and theme at the same time. I think that the artwork is fine. Graphically speaking, it looks decent. I kind of like some of the, the old-timey art on the cards, but I can acknowledge that something is high quality while at the same time admitting that it's incredibly generic. And it's almost like, um, I think Eagle Griffin Games has put up for a couple years in a row on Kickstarter a, um, a game designer's toolkit with, which has a bunch of generic components to let game designers make prototypes for games, including like generic fantasy pieces. That's kind of what it, this artwork feels like to me. Like, here's all the makings of a fantasy game. Make a world out of it. But they didn't make a world out of it. <laughs> so it looks kind of just bland and drab. And there's nothing distinctive about it. There's dragon tokens. And if the dragon victory point card is in play, I'll get to all these mechanics in a second. But it doesn't, it's just the same as the runestone tokens that are in play. So it, it does kind of suck that there's this cool name, sort of cool name, Mythotopia. It kind of sounds like a flavor of Fruitopia that I had once. But um, it's cool that you've got sort of the, the, the kernel of this world, but it wasn't really built up into anything. So that's kind of an, a weird off-putting thing. But as far as the actual physical components, it's okay. Uh, the, it's... I know that the deluxe edition of this game that subscribers to Tree Frog Games, which is a weird thing to say, but those people were able to get sort of wooden pieces for the Mythotopia. I don't really think it would have made too much of a difference. I think it's okay as it is. I uh, just have the tokens for all the different armies and uh, for the ships and such, and that's fine, and the, the cities and villages. It all works good. It's, it's pleasant enough. I just wish that the theme was more uh, tightly tied to, well, everything. <laughs> But let's go ahead and move right on to the mechanics because while it might sound like I'm just totally trashing this game, here's the truth of the matter. I really, really, really enjoyed this game. Way more than I thought that I would. Way more than I even thought I would having played a couple of rounds of it. After a couple of rounds, I was like, oh, this is going to be kind of, I don't know about this. By the end, I was dying to play again. And I played again and my thoughts were confirmed. I was like, this is great. Now, I mentioned in the beginning of this that this was suspiciously similar to studying Emerald in everything but theme. And I still feel that that's true. The deck building mechanic here, and deck building is certainly not new to Martin Wallace games. They, he proudly acknowledges his uh, inspiration from Donald X. Baccarino and Dominion in the rule book. But the spin that he put on it in studying Emerald is carried over almost completely faithfully to Mythotopia. Where you're, you have a certain set of starting cards and uh, actually... Let's just pause for a moment there. I'll give a word of caution that uh, just don't fall into the same pitfall that my group ran into the first time we played, which is that several times in the rule book it refers to five starting cards, but there's only four starting cards. It's a misprint several times over, probably an artifact of an earlier point in the design period of the game, but it's not acknowledged anywhere. We had to go on Board Game Geek where someone finally said, yeah, it's a misprint, <laughs> so it's pretty frustrating. But moving on. So you have your starting hand of cards like any kind of a deck builder, and you can get more powerful cards into your deck, but how that's done and how you actually use the cards is very similar to a study in Emerald. Each card having different symbols, you can only use a card for one thing, and then you use that for the actual area control of the game, which is actually similar to trains as well. But in this case, you're putting out armies or potentially ships onto the board, and uh, hoping to take over that area and put out more tokens, including uh, you go to uh, villages first and then potentially upgrade them into other things by building on top of them. But again, you're using all this through the cards that you start off with and cards that you purchase that have different symbols that can only be used for that one thing. I really enjoy that aspect of the game and it's tied in really in a, in a neat way with the area control where it's essentially a back and forth. It's not like outright combat, like, okay, I declare combat. Let's see who has the higher total. No, it's you flood an area, you inv invade, and that's what it's called. You invade an area with your troops. If you have enough troops, you have to potentially build more troops in order, if you really want to have a, a powerful force. But you invade an area with your troops, and then hopefully by the next turn, the first thing you can do on your turn, and it has to be the first thing, is declare victory. 
Now, if it's a neutral area, you just have to surpass the number and you're, you're probably fine. You'll probably do it. If you're actually trying to hit other players, which you are going to need to do at some point in order to knock them back and put yourself forward, then you need to hope that they were not also able to invade back or to bolster their forces there and not make it into a stalemate or declare victory themselves because you made a really good showing of invading with troops right off the bat and couldn't quite get the job done because you blew your whole wad just getting that primary initial invading force in there. Losing a battle here is not crippling because you don't lose troops per se, they just come off the board, then you can put them out somewhere else. But it's still losing time, losing efficiency, and losing things that you could be doing elsewhere. I think that it's possible in this game to just uh, invade neutral territories and get a lot of points that way. But again, you're still wanting, there's that temptation to take out your opponent because not only are you taking out one of their territories and denying them of points, you're gaining points as well. It's this constant swing back and forth. And I know that it can sometimes feel like you're just keeping track of the territories you control and it doesn't really feel thematic like gaining points. Well, not really thematic, but it's it's not a point salad game in the sense that there's not all these different things that you can do to get points. There's really only a few things um, which can feel a little stifling at times, but I enjoyed the back and forth of taking territories, trying to hold them, uh, occasionally splintering off and trying to do new things like the victory point cards and that's another really interesting aspect of the game. You have the victory point cards that will always be in play like the cities and the roads but then you have uh, just for building those but then you have the randomized victory point cards so you never know what you're going to be going for each game. I probably wish there was more of them but the ones that are there are cool and I know that I bagged on the fact that there's like the runestone card and the dragon card they don't really mean much and not really that different from each other but I like that you have these random things that you can do and that rune zones are pretty easy to take over dragons not so much so I like that you have different F, uh, areas that you can focus on they're not a huge swing in points but you can't ignore them either and people are going to tend to focus on different things and go for different territories and some people can ignore them altogether if they're being incredibly warlike and just going for you so I like that you have these different options to go for. Um, all the different cards that you can purchase from the display, the improvement cards, those are neat. Um, it's, it's kind of tough in this game. One of the actions that you can do, like in any deck building game in some form or another, you can mill out cards from your deck. You can choose to remove cards from your deck, which, but that's risky because chances are you want to remove the cards that are the territory cards, the, uh, the province cards, I should call them. But if you do that, you're risking not leaving yourself open and vulnerable because now you have one less area that you can invade from and it's just one less option that you have. So you have to really carefully think about which cards you're gonna remove from your deck. It's usually better to stow them in your reserve, which is an aspect I really love. Another deck builder I have that I love called Heart of Crown uses an aspect similar to that where you can make a kingdom and stow cards in it. I really love that. I love that you can use them later. I love that you can, uh, by putting out uh, cities, you can make your reserve more powerful, make it bigger and put more cards there. And I think utilizing that constructively and efficiently is, is really what's gonna lead you to victory. It's a huge thing that I've noticed in the games that I've played. And I even like the way that the game ends where you can essentially just say, I have won and I declare victory. Because it doesn't seem like a major thing, like, well, okay, that just means there's like sort of a sudden death to the game, right? But by knowing that the game doesn't exactly end until someone gets to the start of their turn and declares it, the person that's winning, the other players have a chance to react and say, well, no, it's not. We're coming after you. And try to swing those points back away from your favor and back in their favor. I can see people getting frustrated by that constant back and forth. I really liked it. I like a lot of things about this game. I think the deck building is handled well. You have to build your deck efficiently. It's really unforgiving in that regard. If you don't get a good engine going, you will be completely stalled and everyone's going to run ahead of you. It's easy to fall pretty far behind, but I enjoy the area control aspects. I like the back and forth. I like the uh, improvement cards, the different variable victory point cards. I think that Mythotopia, despite the very boring and drab theme, is a solid solid hit of the game and I hope that everyone else gets a chance to try it because no one seems to be talking about it but if you like deck building if you like area control if you like games that are just it's not uber complex it's not too long it's maybe mid to upper mid weight 
it's a perfect sweet spot for me and I loved it. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.